Okay, I think we're live. I'm getting a notification that we're live. So <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> We've been trying to go live for a long time. So we're both excited. Um, I'm Carmen, digital editor at Ms. I'm here with Amy Jo Goddard, who is organizing and masterminding the Sex Power Leadership Online Conference that starts um, in, I guess, a week, right? April 30th. Yeah, uh, next Monday. Exciting. Ms. is a proud media sponsor of the conference. So I just wanted to talk to Amy Jo about sort of what's going to be happening during the event and then also sort of Me Too, sexual politics kind of stuff. So yeah, I guess let's dive in. Um, so the conference, which is, I am super excited sort of about the the inception story too. I'm interested to know, like how did the idea to host this basically massive free online conference sort of, where did that come from and how have you been approaching that process of putting it together? Yeah, well, you know, as everything was happening with me too, I was wanting to, you know, I was watching that closely. I was writing a lot about it. You know, my work for over 20 years has been around sexual empowerment and in particular for women. Um, and I can say that Ms. Magazine was my go-to when I was a young feminist college student who was being, you know, activated um, politically, um, there wasn't a lot of resources. I mean, this was really like a, just a bright light in the darkness. <laughs> and a lot of my, my feminist information and just, you know, we, this was pre-internet folks. I know for some of you, that's hard to imagine, but um, yeah, that's where it came from. And so so super delighted to be working with you on this. And yeah, I think we were looking at, you know, how do we take the conversation to the next level? Um, you know, Me Too has been really, really important. It's been really, uh, you know, it's, it's clear, right? There's a problem. There's definitely a problem. There's something that needs to be addressed here. And there's something in terms of how we've been approaching it that's not working. So how, how do we take this to the next level and see like what's really next for those of us who have been in this work for a long time, who know it's a problem, who this is not, for whom this is not news for, which I know a lot of your readers know that this is not like breaking news, um, <laughs> that sexual violence and sexual harassment are, you know, an enormous issue. Um, and so, so where do we go next? And so I really wanted to bring together luminaries and thought leaders and teachers and um, writers, authors, people that could come from different perspectives and really talk about what the what the nuances are and what the issues are like why hasn't this been working what's wrong with our approach and what needs to happen next yeah awesome and and yeah i mean the conference is bringing together so many sort of people from lots of different backgrounds and areas of expertise which i also think is super interesting that you know, we'll be hearing from Jacqueline Friedman, who our readers are super familiar with, and we actually mm -hmm. interviewed her live too a couple months ago, which was my deep pleasure. I love Jacqueline's work. And I mean, she's obviously someone who seems like such a perfect fit for the conversation. She's, you know, the editor of Yes Means Yes, the author of Unscrewed. She's sort of a sex positivity and rape culture activist at heart. But then there's also people like Dr. Willie Parker, who's a reproductive justice advocate, and Charlene Carruthers, who is, you know, a racial justice powerhouse. And I'm, yeah. I'm sort of, uh, you know, it's a very holistic and intersectional approach. Um, and it's a model, I think, that is a good indicator of a way forward from here. Um, why do you think it's important for us to center issues like sex and gender and sexuality in all of our movements? And how do you think that should or could sort of change the trajectory, not just of me too. I mean, it's clear, right, that when we talk now about labor issues, about workplace issues for women, we need to be talking about gender and sexuality. Um, yeah. because clearly, sexual harassment is a problem that is affecting way too many women workers. Um, and so, yeah, how do you think um, that lens of sexuality sort of applies not just to those issues that seem like you know they fit in that wheelhouse but to all of the 
like sort of interconnected issues that we face. Yeah, I mean, so many ways. I mean, gender is such a huge part of our sexuality and gender identity. And, and um, you know, I think a lot of times people diminish sexuality to being things that are just sex. Um, and I think also people diminish the problems that we have with sexual harassment and sexual violence as being just power. And I don't think that that's true. I actually think that these issues are, they are about power. They are also about sex. They are about the ways in which we don't deal with sex, the ways in which we don't teach people what consent is about, teach people how to set proper boundaries around their bodies and about sex, how we don't teach, um, you know, a, a real ethic of uh, body agency and empowerment and what that looks like to respect somebody else's body's agency um, and sexual agency. I mean, we don't teach that. We don't learn that. And so now what we have is we have a culture that's not dealing with sexuality in an effective way, in a way that is respectful to all humans. And so, of course, like who takes the brunt of uh, of the abuses of that, it's always going to be the people that are most marginalized. So certainly it's women, but in particular, it's trans women, it's women of color. It is um, women who have a lot less social and economic power, um, which is why I think with everything we've seen with Time's Up and Me Too, and seeing some of those bridges being built to like farm workers, to domestic workers, to, um, to women who are in very, very vulnerable situations, that has been very important and that needs to be sustained and it needs to continue. That can't just be, we're giving lip service to it now and then we're just gonna go on and we're gonna forget about that. And so I'm, I'm really watching to see what happens with that. And so, yeah, when we wanted to do this conference, it was like, of course, we want to talk to Jacqueline Friedman. Um, she's doing our opening keynote and Willie Parker is doing our closing keynote, which you are sponsoring. And um, both of them, oh my gosh, I want everyone to see their interviews. Um, their keynotes are just phenomenal. Um, and so I think there's some deep questions that we're asking. And, and so one of those is, you know, in, throughout the conference is what does, what does, an intersectional vision really look like going forward around these issues. We have to be looking at race. We have to be looking at disability. We have to be looking at fat bodies, at, at various um, things that create marginalization and create a situation of having less power and less ability to control what happens to our bodies and our sexuality. So that's a huge, huge theme. And I think another theme of the conference is looking at what are the things that we need to be doing on an individual level to empower ourselves, which we all have work to do because we live in a culture that doesn't empower us. And so we've got to do that for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, and that is a lot of the work that I do in the world. And how do we also hold the collective vision and the collective movements in, that we need to be holding in order to create change in the systems and in the institutions and in the spaces that we are existing in. Because we can do all the empowerment we want over here, but then we've also got to be helping to empower us in those systems in order for us to be able to like go, you know, go the full route um, of our own true empowerment. And so, so it has to be for all of us or it can't be, it, it's not for any of us really. So I think it's both. And so I think those are a couple of the really big questions that we're holding in this conference. Definitely. And I do, um, so we did publish a piece by Amy Jo today on the Ms. blog up on MsMagazine.com. Um, and it did touch on sort of that that idea that, you know, obviously there's a gendered imbalance of power at work because there's a gendered imbalance of power in women's lives in every area of their lives and in many people's lives in different ways. Um, and you sort of laid out, you know, that obviously an ideal solution here is to sort of go back in time and give everyone this like super sex positive feminist comprehensive sex ed um, so that they can enter the workplace without these sort of learned practices and behaviors and outside of a culture that condones harassment and violence and exploitation and even rewards it. 
Um, and you also, but you also laid out some ways that we can intervene right now, things that people can do at the top level to make sure that their organizations are not failing their employees anymore and that, you know, problems of sexual harassment as well as this sort of sexual repression that fuels this cycle of sexual harassment, um, some like very tangible takeaways that they could have. Could you maybe elaborate on some of those? I found them really interesting, um, especially because I do think, you know, when, when I was reading the piece, there's obviously this resistance of like, no, of course that's, you know, this is sexual harassment, it's about power, but it was so clear that, you know, our toxic sex culture, um, I mean, our rape culture has such a huge role to play in all of this. Um, and that until we sort of address that elephant in the room, you know, we're just fueling this cycle, this really vicious cycle of harassment and violence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the perspective, you know, I, I co-wrote the article with Leonor Chia, um, who I've worked with for the last six years. She's quite amazing in her own right as a sexuality educator as well. And so we we were talking about what's missing from the dialogue. And I think what's missing is that, you know, we're, we're talking about workplaces and we're talking about organizations as if they are a sex neutral, squeaky clean environment. And they're not. Um, sexuality is a part of who we are. We don't like leave our sexuality at home when we go to work in the morning. Like it's a part of who we are. It's not an outfit we put on when we want to pull it out. And so if we're not addressing sexuality in a real way, then what happens is people come to work uh, as we don't in our culture, you know, so I'm talking about like the bigger picture. So people come to spaces like work, workplaces where uh, overt you know, sexual dynamics really are inappropriate. And, and so then like what happens is like the sexual energy leaks. And so it leaks in these really unhealthy ways because there isn't actually a space where we can address it in an effective way. And I think HR departments are sort of like famous for trying to create this sort of like, this is a very neutral environment and we just don't do that here. And that's just not human. That's not reality. Um, you know, we, we did a panel as part of the, um, as part of the conference on sex power and leadership and organizations. And one of the things that Andrea Barica talks about in that panel um, who started, she's the executive director of O school. She started O school um, she talked about how, you know, people fall in love at work, people flirt at work, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, fell in love at work, they didn't meet in a bar, <laughs> you know, so it's like, that is a reality. Um, on top of this other piece of just dealing with sexuality in general, it's like, that is a place where sometimes people meet. And so how are we handling that? How are we addressing the sexual dynamics that can go on in a workplace rather than pretending like they're not there, which then means we're actually not addressing the problems with them. So I think that's what we've done. That's what we've done. You know, I remember Anita Hill, you know, the Anita Hill hearings happened when I was a college student. Um, I remember that very, very vividly and what it took for her to, to sit on Capitol Hill in those hearings and everyone was glued to the television watching um, and to do what she did. And here we are, you know, 20, almost 25, yeah, 25 years later, God, I'm aging myself, 25 years later, here we are. And it really hasn't gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's gotten somewhat better, a little bit better. Um, there's been some intervention, there has been some, some laws and some things that have gone on, but really at the end of the day, we're still not dealing with it. Um, it's like, oh, here, watch this video training. And then, okay, now we've dealt with our sexual harassment situation. No, that is not dealing with it because those video trainings don't actually deal with the real like sexuality and humanness of, of the individuals that are on our, that are our employees and that are on our teams. And so until we really have those nuanced conversations about the different ways that gender dynamics and power dynamics and sexual dynamics come up at work, we're not going to be dealing with this full issue. Mm, yeah. And I, I was intrigued too that you sort of called out that most of the stuff that has happened 
when it comes to sexual harassment. I mean, because yeah, this is not a not a new issue. Like Ms. made history by putting sexual harassment on the cover in I think it was 1976. So um, you know, we've been having these conversations. Women have been saying this is happening, and obviously it predates the 70s. Um, and uh, this idea that the fight to end sexual harassment at work, when corporate cultures took it on, basically just looks like what is the bare minimum that we can do to not get sued if someone gets sexually harassed and basically not have to mediate conflict between people. And they want, you know, it's the same problem that happens on college campuses. Like we don't want to talk about sexual assault and rape at our campus orientation because we don't want people to think that that's going to happen when they're here, or we don't want to put information or actually find good comprehensive data and encourage people to come forward and report because we don't want to have to claim that it happened when we have to do our police report at the end of the year that goes in like our admission materials. Like there's this whole very layered culture of silence. This idea of, you know, the the solution is if we talk about it, people get freaked out. If we don't talk about it, we can pretend everything is okay. But then obviously, you know, the cycle is perpetuated. Um, and so in your eyes, what would an actual, you know, anti-sexual harassment training take on? Like, what would people be talking about? What would they be learning about? Um, cause I mean, that's, you know, you're an educator at heart, like sort of what is that better model of setting up a corporate culture? That's like, this does not, and will not happen here. Um, and like, this is what this looks like and how this manifests. Yeah. I mean, I think that it can go in a lot of directions and it really in part depends upon what's happening in the dynamics of each environment. And so I think in part, what is required is not a one size fits all. It's a, let's look at this environment. Um, what, are, what are some of the like um, standing beliefs that people have in this environment about sex and sexuality and gender and workplace romance? And, you know, like, I think there's a lot of things to explore there. And then I think really looking at sexual bias in the workplace, you know, I think like people are used to hearing the term racial bias, right? And, and there's a lot of like more progressive companies. I have friends that work at places like Spotify. They're like, oh yeah, everybody gets a racial bias training. When they come in here, they take that really seriously. We have to also be looking at a sexual bias training. And so what are some of the sexual biases that happen towards women, towards LGBTQ people um, uh, in the workplace? And so I think that's a big piece. And, and, and then I think it's, it's really looking at the cultural norms of the workplace and what are the norms that we want to have here? Um, what do we do when we have a crush on a coworker? What are some of the appropriate ways and inappropriate ways of dealing with that? <laughs> you know, um, what if we, what if it's you know, like not mutual? What happens there? Um, what if, you know, I think there's sort of like a lot of scenarios we can be looking at and need to be looking at. What if there's a power imbalance? Obviously, it's a big one. Um, what if, you know, I have a crush on you and I have power over you at work? What if you have a crush on me and you have power over me? Like, you know, what do these different scenarios look like? How could we handle those? Um, what is some language we might want to be using to talk about these things? You know, and, and then I think it's also just like some basic education about sexuality and sexual energy. Um, you know, I think that sexuality and, you know, is, is you know, the sexual energy that really fuels uh, our sexuality also fuels our creative projects. It, you know, sexual energy and creative energy are the same thing. They come from the same well. They're not different. So obviously if we want our workers to be creative, then that energy is at work. And sometimes people get really lit up when they're on a project. People like do, you know, like, you know, that's a lot of times where like big crushes can happen. Cause it's like, oh my God, we're in here and we're like creating this thing and it's really exciting. Oh, you're really exciting. Like, this is cool that we're experiencing this together. We're creating this thing together, you know? And so like, that's real. That's just like, that's a part of our humanity. And so as long as we're, treating the work environment like it's a squeaky clean sex neutral environment 
we're not actually dealing with real life and real humanity. And, um, and actually, I think that it, it does a disservice to the people, you know, your workers and the people that are on your teams, because that energy is important in our projects and our art and yeah. the thing, you know, and our programming, you know, the things that you might be creating together. And so, okay, so if we could like address that and actually talk about that in a mature adult way, <laughs> what, what could we do with that? You know, how could we... How could we talk about what's appropriate in terms of how we harness that energy at work and, and what's not? And, you know, I know that there's been a lot of humor around things since Me Too and, you know, a lot of comedians that are just like, yeah, duh, you don't do that at work. But I think we do have to say, you know, I think we do have to say the things. I think we do have to make it clear. It's, it's obvious we have to make it clear because people are... Uh, you know, there's just been a lot of boundary pushing and a lot of like, clearly lack of clarity about what those boundaries are. And so I think like we can't make assumptions right now. I think actually we have to do some of that real 101 work. But then I think what's interesting and where the real movement is going to happen is where we have the more nuanced conversations. Mm, yeah. And, you know, the sooner we can begin to have a real practical and human conversations about these sort of healthier um, instances of like confronting sexuality in the workplace, you know, like you and your coworker are flirting with each other, what's happening, the sooner we can also get to the point where we're like, and that is obviously because it is unacceptable to, you know, forcibly touch someone at work or, you know, basically um, communicate that if they don't perform a certain sexual behavior with you that they'll get fired or get in trouble or be blacklisted or some of the more the like very insidious stuff that we've witnessed obviously comes from this idea of you know how do you speak out about these really I mean no questions asked clearly inappropriate and destructive um forms of sexual harassment where it is a direct power play and, you know, it's like very evident what's happening here and it's violating. Um, and the reason is, you know, it's hard to come forward about stuff like that when we still live in a culture where survivors of sexual assault aren't believed and you're not supposed to talk about that stuff at work. Like right. You know, right. we can't, yep. we can't possibly believe that this happened to you, or at least we're going to pretend that we can't, because we don't talk about that at work. And, you know, we trust that our male colleague would never behave that way because like, that's just not how people behave here versus sort of saying we have a healthy culture here. This is clearly with outside of the bounds of this healthy, more open culture. So I think that that is super interesting. And I'm, I'm curious to, um, in terms of yeah. the sort of, the larger, you know, sex positivity and anti-rape culture and anti-sexual harassment and assault movements, how do those movements sort of move forward in the age of Me Too to incorporate, um, you know, sort of these, these elements of workplace discrimination and harassment too. Um, you know, cause this idea now that men are like, I'm just not gonna have lunch with women in my office, not gonna give them any opportunities to meet with me or be mentored by me because God forbid they say that I sexually harass them or, um, you know, that there's this backlash brewing and so many of the conversations we've had about sexuality have been about sex or, right. you know, uh, sexuality in terms of our sexual identities, like in the LGBTQ space. So how do we sort of move those over to talking about all of those concepts and also talking about the workspace? Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of the things that we're already doing apply and it's really just bringing those conversations into workplace conversations and, um, and helping people to define um, their kind of like codes of conduct in a different way and to address the things that sex educators have been teaching for years. I mean, we've been doing this work. This, it, this isn't new. Um, this isn't new. It's just new for a bunch of people that haven't dealt with it before. 
So, um, you know, and I, I guess the other thing as you were talking that I want to say is that like what people really need is to learn how to communicate effectively, how to communicate their boundaries in a kind way, and also how to accept rejection, how to accept a no, how to graciously accept, uh, I'm not interested in you the way that you're interested in me, but you know, thank you. <laughs> like, whatever, thank you for letting me know that. Or, you know, so I think it's like, also just how to navigate those dynamics that happen um, in particular between men and women, but they can happen between people of all genders. And um, a lot of times, of course, what we've seen is that women end up really at risk for harm when they just say no. I mean, there's a real threat there. There has been a reality. I mean, women have gotten killed for saying, I don't want to dance with you, you know? So, um, so that, that is a reality. And, you know, I think the, that this is an opportunity, you know, and, and people might say, well, that doesn't belong in the workplace. That's not the job of the workplace. Well, you know what? It happens in the workplace. So you can either decide this isn't the job of the workplace, or you can say, we want to be on the cutting edge. We want to actually have the conversations that are going to help our employees who are whole people. They're not just our workers. You know, they bring their whole selves to work. And, you know, so just in the way that, you know, workplaces have health, you know, health workshops and programs to help employees with their stress and the things that can can be affected by the workplace or that can interfere with their work, we need to be having these conversations too. And, 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 and we need to be helping them develop the real skills and the emotional capacity to deal with each other in a more effective way, just as we're addressing diversity, just as we're addressing you know, racial bias, we need to be able to handle these conversations and have these conversations. That doesn't mean that we have to do all that work in the workplace, but this is obviously a prime moment and an important moment where workplaces can either decide to really lead and treat their employees as whole people that have some needs, um, and that that means, you know, that, that that is a part of creating a safe work environment for all of their employees, including women, including people in the LGBTQ community. Um, or they can just continue to turn the other way and pretend like, you know, that doesn't happen here. Um, we're not one of those colleges. We're not one of those workplaces. Because we all know that, like, it doesn't mean that there's a problem with you. This is cultural. This is, this is part of the bigger culture. This isn't one university. This isn't, this isn't one workplace. And so you either, you're dealing with it or you're not. And if you're not, you're putting people at risk, period. Yeah, definitely. And um, so these kinds of conversations uh, that we're having right now are definitely... <laughs> the kinds of conversations you've been having for like the last couple of months as you've gotten yeah. ready for the sex power leadership conference that starts on Monday um and you know I know that you've been holding interviews that there are keynote speeches that you've just got this really this treasure trove of goodness coming out in like a week um what I'm super excited about it and I know you must be too and I'm sort of curious about what sessions you are the most excited for um, to be hosting for the? Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're all so good. I can't even like, I'm like, I can't even believe the quality of the conference and all of the sessions. Um, but yeah, we kick off, I'm going to kick it off Monday morning and I'm actually going to be interviewing Nanine McCool, who is the woman who challenged Tony Robbins uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so she's actually going to come on live with me Monday morning to kick everything off. Um, Jacqueline Friedman is our opening keynote. Her, her, her talk is just phenomenal. And then our opening panel is an, a panel on intersections, um, race, gender, sexuality, and power. And um, just a phenomenal panel with um, Marla Renee Stewart, um, Delicia from Afrosexology, and um, Ida Mandalay, who is just a phenomenal powerhouse activist and educator um, and therapist. And so, um, so that's our kickoff day. That's just Monday. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, we've got panels on everything from, as I said, sex, power, and leadership in organizations to the sexual double bind for men, because I think like there's some real issues that have to be like called out and addressed around men and, and the very difficult position that men are put in. 
Um, there is an excellent panel on um, on uh, the um, the consensual power exchange as an antidote to patriarchy, and so we brought people in from the the kink world to talk about that. Um, there's there's such a, a like a long list of of amazing panels and we can list some of them here um, in the comments for people to see um, but yeah some of the other speakers we've got Meg John Barker who is just a phenomenal educator therapist does a lot of work around gender and talking about how we need to not be talking about LGBTQ anymore we need to be talking about sex gender and relationship diversity that that's actually where the conversation is going so these are like cutting edge conversations of like this is where things need to go um, Willie Parker of course talking about toxic masculinity, patriarchy, white supremacy, reproductive justice. I mean, like his, his closing keynote is unbelievable. It's so good. Um, Beverly Little Thunder talking about being two spirit and being a leader in the native community who was asked to leave her reservation and to go do ceremony for her own kind and what that meant, you know, as, as a native woman who was also lesbian um, and you know and was a part of the conversation of creating the type the the name the identity to spirit so really beautiful interview with her um just just really some phenomenal people um a fantastic uh session on consent and the wheel of consent with one of the like prominent consent educators betty martin she's just absolutely phenomenal um, everybody needs to be there for that. I mean, it's just, it's so good. It really, every single panel is so good. Um, so yeah, we'll list them here so you can check it out. If you go to amyjoegoddard.com slash sex power leadership, um, you can see like the whole list there of everything and it's free to register. You know, if you, if you want to buy, uh, packages, you can definitely do that so that you don't miss anything. Um, but if you want to come on live with us, it's free for everybody. So we really, really want people to join us and be a part of the conversation. There's a Facebook group. We're going to be having a lot of dialogue throughout the conference. I mean, I really want this to take the conversation to the next level, right? We've got the, you know, me to opened it up. And so what's the 201? What's the 301 conversation here? Yeah, definitely. I was going to say, it's like the conference for the me too moment. You know, it's a sort of perfect time for us to hunker down and <laughs> examine how sexuality and um, gender norms and all of these intersections play into our lives personally and professionally and politically. So it's definitely, yeah, I am very excited about the conference that I'm so glad that we could um, chat and break through in some of these topics here today. Um, and I'll definitely, I'll also drop a registration link in the comments after this so that people can use the special Ms. link to sign up for free or pick out their packages. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Amy Jo. It has been super amazing. I am glad we finally figured out how to take this live. And I'm secretly, I'm crossing my fingers that when we're done, we don't like go to the Facebook page and find that it was not there the entire time. I'm hoping it's there. <sighs> Oh, I think you're muted. <sighs> there was a plane overhead and I muted myself. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I really also just wanna say, I want people of all genders to come, you know, and people of all genders are signing up and we're really happy to see that because we all need to be in conversation with each other. This isn't a women's conversation. This isn't a queer conversation. This isn't a people of color conversation. This is all of us, like this is really, an opportunity and, and you'll see that the speakers are incredibly diverse. Um, um, Charlene Carruthers, as you mentioned earlier, also Adrian Marie Brown. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. There's such a phenomenal list of people um, and really diverse and coming from a lot of different perspectives. And that's what we want to have in our live Facebook group. There's a Facebook group for it. Come join us over there. We're going to really you know, it's not just about listening to the talks. It's also about like the conversation that we're having and the calls to action for like, what's next? Like, this is really about us and figuring out what's next and us being the ones to lead the conversation. And we want you to be a part of that. So this is what it's about.
So yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Yeah, for, for sponsoring you. and being a part of it. We're really happy to be working with you. On yeah, that. we're super excited too. And I am in that Facebook group and super excited to see, you know, the next phase of the movement get made. So yeah, let's do this. <sighs> Sounds great. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you for having me today. It's really great to be here with you. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. All right. Come to the conference, everyone. <laughs>